Hello there, what's going on? Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 767. That is 767 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you are doing well wherever, 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 wherever this lovely, bloody podcast may find you. I hope you are doing swimmingly, hope you're doing fine, hope you're well hydrated, well rested, and all the those things in between that's all i really hope for you right now i really really do how am i yeah all, all good good all, all things considered i cannot complain i really cannot complain it's been a bit rough over here and there but you know we get it done we get it done we get it done we get it done i was actually checking on the social webs today and I saw the one and only Rihanna, right? The one and only Riri out here in London, actually the other day launching um, a new pair of Pumas. She's got those, you know, those Puma creepers that all the girls loved. I think back in the day when I was, you know, being a fucking playboy, I think I might have bought a couple of pairs for some ladies back in the day. There's some really, really nice shoes. Actually, I actually don't mind them. They're basically Puma Clyde, but they've got like an exaggerated thicker sole. Well, she's back again with Puma with more of those Puma Clydes. This time a bit more of a chunkier silhouette and this time in more earthier tones. So she's back in London promoting it not sure why she picked london to promote these actual shoes but i guess you know why the hell not why the hell not so she decided to come to london and promote these shoes and i have to give this woman some credit right she came in here and i've seen i'm not gonna lie i think i've seen like a hundred videos already of rihanna having interactions with different influencers and different noteworthy uk based people and I swear to God, right, she must have exhausted, she must have literally exhausted her flipping socializing, her, her, her social, her social battery, her social battery, her interaction battery must be absolutely depleted because she was talking to the entire room. I think I saw a particular video where she did look to get a little bit tired, a little bit restless, but I'm also wondering at this moment, whether motherhood is actually helping Rihanna maybe the fact that she's a mother now and she's somewhat you know softly retired from doing music the fact that she's at home all day probably legitimately looking after kids like you know Rihanna seems like one celebrity who I could actually believe does look after her own children she doesn't probably have an army full of nannies and other nondescript you know South American Central American women raising her kids I can imagine that she spends a lot of time actually raising her children along with Rocky along with their family in-laws and all that malarkey but maybe the fact that she's a mum, maybe the fact that she's a mum, it allows her the ability to step out to these events and not be tired. Maybe that's what makes it worthwhile because she's a mum and she's at home alone, just chilling. She's a bit older too. She's not a party girl as she used to be anymore. So maybe when she goes to these events, it's actually a bit of a socialising thing as well. As much as it's work, it's actually fun. I couldn't imagine it, to be fair, because it seems like a lot of social interactions. Like, you know, girls who are very picky about who they sleep with and they call it soul ties you know there's some girls who are like oh you can't sleep with any random dude because you're you know you're you're you're, you're making soul ties with strangers that that person's not involved in your life anymore they could disrupt you from afar and do all sorts of weird juju mad stuff in your life and whatever which makes sense and i think the same thing has to be said with just talking to people socially there's only so much communication so much of your own thoughts ideas whatever you can give to somebody else before it gets a bit shaky so i think in this particular regard maybe motherhood is helping rihanna because some of these interactions were hilarious like this particular one i'm going to play you but the rest of them were really really awkward and weird and not on her part mostly because you know she's fucking rihanna and you're going to interview her at this kind of influence event it's going to be a bit random but i think she handled it pretty well so let's play a clip here of rihanna doing her best british accent <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> we were gonna ask you to say I'm so fucking embarrassed. <laughs> it's gonna be awful. My big fatty creepers. Hashtag fatty. Can't believe you embarrassed me this way. <laughs> you see, it only lasts for like five seconds and then it starts drifting into like Beijing. <laughs> Okay, I don't mind that. So big up Rihanna in that regard. We see obviously rocking the blonde hair. We love to see it. Um, her hanging out with Ira Star. That was a really fun interaction, by the way. So big up her. The actual outfit she wore, kind of looking like Billie Eilish. I'm not gonna lie. 
Rihanna's kind of doing her uh, her best impression of Billie Eilish with that suit, but still, everybody kind of likes it. She told Ira Star that she's got an open verse to send her an email and let her know she'll jump on the track. That was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it was all really fun. All really, really, really fun. But I can't lie, looking at these videos made me understand that, you know, as much as we like to say people like Rihanna and other quote-unquote influencers, because she's not really an artist anymore, she's more of an entrepreneur, businesswoman and all that stuff. But I think people like to say people like this don't really earn their money. But I think they do. I think they really do earn their money. They 100% earn their money, man. Because how how many of us could really go to these events and just be yapping with strangers all day long and be okay with it? How many of us could be in these type of events and just be like yapping, 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 yapping to people who feel like they know us, we don't know them, and you're having to give them all the time of the day. You have to make them feel like they're the center of the world. You also have to keep your professional influencer face on. You're trying to sell these shoes anyway in the first place. It's really, it must be difficult. It must be a job in its own regard. It must be, I wouldn't say it's a talent, but I'd say it's a skill. Definitely it's a skill to be a level of a celebrity a level of a no V person at this type of level where you're having all these type of random interactions with people and to them it's like their main thing right they can't get over the fact that they've seen you for you it's just another day in the park like she's probably done these events millions of times jumping on a plane heading over to london jumping in a fucking black truck heading over to the venue doing this fucking meet and greets right to make it think f- fucking worthy and then continuing on and on and on and of course she was asked about her new album like she always is every flipping interview um i have to say like as much as i love rihanna and i love her union with flipping rocky and stuff and i'm a big fan of her previous albums i'm not really waiting or eager or give a shit about her new album i'm not gonna lie i think music has kind of moved on even though she's a great she's amazing I don't really know how many people are really waiting, actually, legitimately waiting for a new album. And there's every possibility that it might be terrible. There's every possibility that she's taken so much time away from music. When she comes back, it might not be good. So this idea that she should jump back into music just for the sake of it is a bit silly. Um, I would love to know why, why she doesn't just say she's going to retire. I wonder why that's why that's not allowed. I wonder if there's some sort of like stipulation in her contract that prevents her from saying, I'm retired. Maybe there is something. Maybe there's some sort of clause. You're not actually allowed to say it like vocally because she's act like she's retired, right? She's basically got, I think she's got three kids or two. Two kids with Rocky at the moment. Business at Fenty is booming better than ever. Rocky's now become a full-time influencer, you know, what you call it, guy in his own right. He does like music festivals just as like kind of top-up money for the kids, really. They They don't really need the money, either of them. So what is the need to do the music, you know? her legacy is already cemented it doesn't feel like it's going to really add anything to anything it just kind of you know make things a bit difficult for her in terms of how she's regarded because whatever last album you put out that's how people will remember you they won't remember anti they won't remember all the other previous ones they'll just remember the one that you just recently so maybe there's a lot of risk maybe there's more risk involved with rihanna coming back and dropping the album than most people do believe positions in the future i mean any plans to have rizza and riot on your upcoming album just they just think mean, it's up to them yeah. i already got stuff that i feel like i can make hits out of oh yeah really give me more me and rocky are really like trying to figure out who's going to use what really yeah because it's so good wow okay she seems confident she seems hyped that she's got some new stuff out that's coming. She didn't seem annoyed by the questions because sometimes in the past she was quite annoyed by the same old question about when she's going to flip and produce, you know, when she's going to, you know, get, when the new album's going to drop. She didn't seem annoyed or pissed off in the slightest. So maybe, 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 maybe there is going to be something on us on the horizon. But I don't know. I just think in general, you know, don't expect to see anything anytime soon. Don't expect to see her anytime soon. And also maybe praying for her to, uh, you know, come back and put music out might not be, might not be the reason why we want her back. I love this answer too that she put regarding her nipple era, regarding her, you know, more salacious era of her time. The fact that she's moving on. And I think this is a big part of maturity and a lot of things that nowadays has become a bit taboo, I feel like. People don't like to do this anymore. People are now trying to basically embrace the idea that we're all going to be forever young, 
There is no time limit to anything. You can do anything when you want to do it, blah, blah, blah. And I personally always have thought that there is a lot of grace in terms of hanging up the hat, in terms of hanging up your boots, hanging up your gloves and deciding to move on to other things in your life. I think there's a lot of grace to that, especially when you do it on your terms, especially when you decide when you want to do it, not when the industry decides, not when your body, you know, starts, starts to become appealing, quote unquote, not when you lose any kind of confidence. No, you decide, hey, I had some time. I had my hot girl time. Now I'm a mom. Now I'm a mogul. Now I'm a businesswoman. Now I'm an entrepreneur. Things are going in a different direction. So I loved her answer to this. I'm not going to lie. It's going to sound hypocritical, but because I did so much in my life. I have my nipples out. I have my panties out. But now those are the things, like, I guess as a mom and, like, an evolved <laughs> young lady, young, emphasis on young, it's just things that I just feel like I would never do or I'm just like, oh, my God, I really did that? Nips out. Yeah, exactly. And I agree with her. I agree with her. I think everything has its moment. Everything has its time. I wouldn't say her era of having a nips out and shit was an ick. It was a period, fair enough, but she's now legitimately, as the caption says, a 36-year-old woman, basically. She definitely sees herself in a completely different light. And I'd imagine being a celeb, you probably age a bit different too. So even though she's 36, she's probably older than that because of how young she came into the industry, because of the amount of stuff she's accomplished, the places that she's been, the people that she's with, the business that she conducts. She's probably a lot older in reality than a regular you know 36 year old so it does make a lot of sense that she would say you know what i'm kind of you know i kind of look at that period and i'm like you know what not for me anymore and i completely get it i get it completely 100 percent. so great to see rihanna out there in the streets out there in the streets of london parading around um debuting obviously this new fringe that she's sporting and obviously promoting that new puma um stacked clyde that everybody's going flipping goo gaga so i really do um love to see it i really do love to see it um let's continue on from that so next on the time next on list to check her out let's talk about double xl double xl did a really cool interview with um gunner where he kind of opened up about everything that happened to him concerning the you know the, the the ysl trial the young thug snitching allegations and all this malarkey and it's a really cool interview to be fair but it also kind of reminded me of how unfortunate it is how unfortunate things kind of played out for gunner because part of me believes some of these you know crime prison um you know youtubers who basically were suggesting that gunner would have never done any hard time anyway the you know the feds basically brought him in to put pressure on the whole gang um because obviously they, they got everybody associated with ysl in on that rico but he was never gonna face any real deep charges like if he just would have sat down kept his mouth shut didn't do any of the pointing he did or yes mamming he did in the courts he probably still would have got out anyway maybe not as soon as he did but he would have got out anyway especially before young fuck you know who hasn't had any bail for like a year or something but other people are suggesting that what he did didn't actually cause you know any harm and that the rico case was always going to go as go where it's going to go and that the you know the um, the courts had enough evidence to basically prosecute them as a gang anyway so it wasn't like he was revealing anything crazy but regardless the perception of it is bad enough so people now perceive gunner to be a, a snitch and essentially you can tell because he hasn't hanged around with any other rappers right he's kind of come out from prison and he's kind of been on his own every time he's on you know there's a video of him um outside and stuff doing his ting you know he's kind of by himself just him and his assistant him and his photographer there's no horde of like rappers and hangers on anymore it's a very small team clearly because people are trying to stay away from him because that's the basically you know one of the rules of the streets if you do snitch you basically you know sometimes you can come back around but you're just not allowed to come back around around us like you know no one's going to talk to you no one's your friend anymore just go and stay over there and kind of mind your business which is obviously super sad but i guess it kind of is what it is so he kind of does answer a lot of questions around this and gives i won't say a lot but he does give some insight into his mental and how he's basically feeling and it's also interesting because i remember when i was following this especially with academics academics was making it seem like if gunner didn't come out and do an interview his career would never flourish and if anything he's really proved that you know i think six nine obviously was the first person to prove it but it really does doesn't matter like you can snitch and come back you know make sick records and for the most part your fans are still gonna love you 
He didn't need to sit down with Angie Martinez. He didn't need to do a Joe Biden interview. He didn't need to go on stream with academics. He didn't need to go on stream with Kai Sina or Aidan Ross. He just came back, dropped some great tracks, dropped an album that people thought should have been nominated for a Grammy. It probably should have, but because of hip-hop politics and shit, it probably didn't get nominated as a Grammy. And then it kind of went where it went. So I do really give him a lot of flipping credit for that. So let's actually go through the actual thing. They actually asked him about how, um, what do you call it? Uh, how much weight he lost. He lost about 30 to 40 pounds. See what I mean about men? I've, I've always said this before. I've, I've always said that I think men or just people in general, if you lost up to 50 pounds or if you lost anywhere between 10 to 50 pounds, you could probably do a lot better. You could probably improve your overall looks more than going under the knife or something. The ability to lose that much weight and then have your dress size, your pants size lower a bit completely opens up a completely whole different paradigm of options for you when it comes to clothes so weight does really affect a lot of your style a lot of your self-confidence a lot of how your posture how you carry yourself so you know him losing 30 to 40 pounds especially when you're a gunner and you're into wearing loads of like you know luxury designer clothes you're into wearing a little bit of rick a little bit um what you call it rick owens you're into wearing a little bit of you know um what how would you call it um, chrome hearts all these type of brands it's actually beneficial to lose a little bit of that weight because it opens up your ability to then be able to wear all these garments without having shit stretched out and shit so men really could you know improve a lot of their fucking personal style by dropping 30 to 50 pounds as you can see here from gunner and then suddenly now he's out here wearing vests with his arms out and shit he's wearing way tighter pants he's put you know he's tucking his shirt into his pants probably for the first time in yonks wearing shorts with matching vest tops and shit so it completely went different but i also have to admit seeing him like this is a bit wild because you know it's also a reminder that young thug isn't out right while young thug is uh, you know rotting in prison essentially without bail awaiting for his trial gunner's out here literally flourishing that's the only thing that kind of leaves a bad taste in your mouth. You know what I mean? It's a bit hard to take. Like, he literally, he's out here flourishing. He hasn't looked healthier. He looks amazing. He looks like he's in actually a, a good mental space. He's probably doing fucking meditation. He's probably taking up yoga as well. Like, he legitimately looks really fucking good. So, that's a really hard bit to take of it. If you're a big YSL fan like I am, or a big Gunner, you know, and Young Fug fan is that, you know, it kind of feels like he just abandoned, you know, Young Fug and left him there and went out and did his own thing. And, you know, since that, the other rappers have also kind of distanced himself from him, which is a bit sad. But let's, let's carry on with the actual thing itself, the actual article. It says, how did it happen? He said, less eating, especially when I went to jail. I lost a lot of weight, just like cleansing, detoxing. And when I got home, I started working out and just keeping fit. And now I'm on a year straight of all working out. So... That is really the key to it, right? That's the key to losing a lot of weight, just not eating. Right? I can say for myself, like, you know, having been a fat shit and been a skinny shit, it really is the most important thing, the eating part, which is odd because I think when you work out, you realize quite quickly the most important thing to actually losing weight is the eating and not the working out. Even though the working out is hard and strenuous, I think most of us, myself included, could probably work out every day if we wanted to right every day if we wanted to for an hour max we wanted to we could do it seven days per week but can you stick to a diet seven days per week that's the hard bit can you only eat scrambled eggs and you know and fucking what you call it with some hot sauce on it or bacon and sausages can you resist the urge of going to a takeaway can you resist the urge of mcdonald's can you resist the urge of a sandwich a this a that a muffin blah, blah, blah. that's the actual hard bit about it it's not the actual working out which is wild to think because working out is difficult but the eating part is the worst where did you um where did you go so were you doing it before you got locked up or did it happen while you were in jail as a way to change yourself he said i tried to work out for a second but then i stopped for a minute i just wasn't committed yeah for sure you'd imagine when you're in jail you can't really think about it. that's probably the dream that i have never been to jail is that you go to jail and you become this amazing guy when you come out but I guess when you're on trial for whatever they were on trial for, you've got so many other things in your mind, you can't really think about reinventing yourself. You can do one thing, which is maybe stop eating and kind of use that time to kind of cleanse yourself. And obviously you don't have the drugs and shit anymore. So you have to kind of rely on other things to kind of center you. But you're not really thinking about, you know, reinvention and rebuilding yourself and self-actualization. You're not thinking about it. You just want to get out of fucking prison. 
It says, yeah, the first images of you that were leaked after you got to jail, everyone saw in your body and was shocked. It must have felt good. He said, it was cool. I can't control well. I can control how my body looked, you know. When I got out of jail, you can't. So it was just like going to the motion. How are you maintaining your physical right now? First, you in the gym, I've leaked online. Is it working out regular as part of your life? He said, yes, I got a trainer. I work out six days a week. I eat better. I eat clean. And that's something I'm disciplining myself for every day. It's something that I'm liking though. I feel better when I work out. Exactly. He went from not working out at all to working out. So this, this happens a lot though. If you're a dude that was fat and I've been really, really fat before, like, you know, 260 plus pounds and i went down to like 180 at my kind of my skinniest so when you do do that the first time it's incredibly easy to lose a bunch of weight just from not eating just from changing your fucking diet it works really fucking easily it's incredibly easy to do more easy than you probably think it is it's probably wild and obviously over time it kind of plateaus a bit but the most important thing is just making sure you kind of tighten up the diet and shit it continues um what does it mean to evolve as an artist? As I evolve, my music evolves. I'm not the same 24 year old that I was putting out drip season free. You know what I'm saying? Now I'm 30, I'm dropping bittersweet and a gift and a curse. The trans that resonates with how I'm feeling. Back then I did it too, but that was for that time. So this time I'm evolving differently. That's what's trying to apply the music. Oh, this feels like he's distancing himself a lot from YSL, isn't it? I'm evolving. I'm not the same guy as Drip Season. I'm not the Drip Season gunner anymore. Oh, this feels like he's evolving. He's trying to separate himself. Um, you've had a lot going on. The case you're involved in with currently has a trial going on and you can't really talk about much of it going on. But to touch on <laughs> this article, what kind of answer question is that? So many qualifiers. You have a lot going on. The case you're involved in currently has a trial going on and you can't really talk about it how much as it's ongoing. <laughs> but, too, but too much on the whole thing and a bit of what happened to you. How did your legal troubles and the jail bid throw you off your career? He says it did a lot. I had a real big effect on my career as far as my, like shows, schedules, impact on like everything we had planned for rollouts, for albums. I had a lot to affect on that just because everything was being so high profile, but it's like, it's still going, you know, and I'm like in the motion of it right now. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause if I remember correctly, he did link up with Poochie just before he went to jail and he was on trial. So it makes a lot of sense why he's saying what he's saying right now. So big up him, big up him. So you got locked up, um, you dealt with it, you lose deals, lose business, you lost support, yes. So you're, you're fighting on one side and fighting your business and livelihood on the other. What did you that do to you? He says, I'm still fighting, still fighting. We've got to go, we, we got to go live in the moment of it. We've got to live in the moment of it. I can't stop and not stop it. What's your relationship with Young Fug now? It's the same. It's love always. Our relationship is our relationship. That doesn't feel good though. That doesn't feel good. What's your relationship with Young Fug now? It's the same. What does that mean? It's the same. When, when did you last speak to him you know i don't i don't believe that in the slightest i don't think they're friends at all he definitely did snitch um according to gunner to a young thug i remember hearing that jail call of young thug telling people to like go at him on their album and stuff for the snitch and shit so i don't think he was happy about it and to be fair the the, the writing was on the wall i remember this iconic clip of when they both got arrested and they both were in court via zoom and young thug saw gunner on the screen and Gunner didn't want to look up. He was like kind of avoiding eye contact. He kind of looked really sheepish. And Young Fuck was like, hey, what's going on, boy? You look good. You look good. Blah, blah, blah. And Gunner kind of like gave him some weird smirk. But he wouldn't really want to look at him too much. So I think by that time, Gunner already had snitched. But, he, you know, he felt kind of guilty about it. That's my theory. It was a really strange video. Um, and I think Young Fuck also realized. I think it's one of those unspoken things that you realize when you're, uh, when you're a street dude. You kind of see when people, you know, the moment they snitch, you can kind of tell. It's almost like that scene in, you know, in the Last Supper, you know, when Jesus kind of realized Judas is kind of, you know, uh, fucking betrayed him, and he kind of comforts him and shit. I mean, you're, you know, you know, what I want. It's the same. People like Little Dirk, Twenty One Savage, Little Baby, among others, have either commented about you snitched or alluded to it in songs. Many people in media outlets have speculated that you are not cool with these people anymore. What's your response to that? Are you cool with them or not anymore? Let's see what he answers. None of those rappers, they're not on the case. They don't know legally what's going on. So basically they're not cool. It doesn't really answer it, but they're not cool. Have you spoken to these guys? I talked to like maybe two or three of those guys. I talked to them on the phone. Okay. So he's spoken to two or three of these guys. Hmm. I don't believe it, to be fair. Peacefully or on good terms? Yeah, peacefully. A lot of people have opinions and comments on the situation. Have you for, ever thought 
that you've gotten a fair shake from people and have you gotten a bad reputation that you don't deserve? I didn't feel like everybody's been misled. I definitely feel like everyone's been misled. I like, you know, when you're being misled, you got a chance, a choice to follow or make your own decision. And that's what's being shown right now. You're being a follower or you're being neutral to it. I don't know what their business is or what they really got going on. I don't see why he just does again obviously you don't want to admit you're a snitch but i don't see why this is like a big issue we are we saw what we saw we saw the yes man videos you know we know the situation just admit you snitched and keep it moving it's not a big of a deal or basically add some context to it like oh this is the deal that i was offered that would allow me to get some time out when we, me and young fuck were talking we came to an agreement that if ever we did get hammed up because i'm the artist and never been involved in the street shit it's okay if I did so and so, because that could be one suggestion. But the lying is just weird. Like it's just intentionally lying about it. makes no sense. But hey, what do I know? Some of these rappers put out songs with lyrics. People think are directed towards you. Do you think they're about you? I honestly didn't hear the lyrics. You didn't even listen. Honestly, I didn't. But I don't listen to other rappers as much as an, unless I'm something I catch my attention. Even before, even just even before because of my recording process, if I might like a song, I might fuck around and make the song a bad bitch song because I was just hearing that. So like, I try not to listen to so many rappers so I kind of do my own thing. Okay, again, not too sure how much of that I actually believe, but it's good to see Ghana back in good spirits and at least he is pushing forward and maintaining because. I think quietly he's accepted the fact that he's never really going to be called a lot of those people. I think socially or reputationally, a lot of those guys, even if they did speak to him on the phone, the Dirks, 21 Savages, Little Babies, they probably wouldn't want to be seen with him because it would ruin their street reputation. Even though they're probably cool, with, even though they, I could see a scenario where they could be cool with him in private, I don't think they'd ever want to admit it in public because it would make them look bad. It would make look, them look like they're co-signing a snitch. It would put into question everything they said about 6 9 back in the day because they're hanging out with him do you know what I mean because obviously then you're then you're definitely like moving the goalposts because you're saying oh 6 9 can't snitch but he can kind of thing so again I don't believe that they're friends I don't believe that they're cool at all in the slightest personally but I also don't believe that it's an issue so I think it's perfectly okay I think it's perfectly fucking okay what can you do what can you bloody do absolutely nothing i think absolutely nothing anyways what else have we got going on here let's continue let's continue let's continue let's continue so i also wanted to show you this this features a clip or a picture i saw on twitter where it features um yay in his brand new cyber truck which I'm still thinking I kind of want. I'm not going to lie. I'm still thinking I kind of want this fucking car. It looks fucking gorgeous to me. I know people don't like it and it's really marmite but I think the Cybertruck, especially with the um, aero cap wheel things, because allegedly I remember I check out a couple of very prominent um, Tesla Cybertruck channels and they've, and they've all said without a doubt, that some reason this Tesla Cybertruck wheel caps are limited edition. They're quite hard to they're quite hard to get a hold of. Um, Tesla hasn't made enough, so they're still producing them. So a lot of the cars that you're seeing or Cybertruck you see on the road don't have the little you know caps on them the, to cover the wheel. And I think that's what makes the Cybertruck look almost otherworldly, like it could be like a Mars rover or something. So without them, the Cybertruck looks a bit strange. So I actually like that. Yay happens to have one that actually has the fucking wheel caps on it. So it looks fucking sick. I also like the fact that whenever i've seen a picture of yay in a car he's never driving he's always got someone so it's like a really nice car you have like a fucking lambo a mercedes or something and you just have some some other person driving it for him i wonder what that's about are those, do those people do those people exist do those people exist who like don't really enjoy driving but they like sitting in nice things so they'll get people to just drive them around in their nice car i wonder if that's actually a thing it must be but it's strange to me because I'd want to, you know, if you have nice cars, the first thing you want to do is drive them around yourself. But I guess, you know, EA has a different process. But 
I really like the Cybertruck. Um, it's unlikely it's ever going to come to the UK. If it does come to the UK, they basically said they have to change it dra- dramatically to make it fit into to make it fit with um, UK fucking road safety standards and Europe safety standards also. So most likely they would have to make it a little bit more rounded. It'd have to be smaller. So it would kind of take away from the entire design ethos of the Cybertruck and why, you know, Elon and Tesla decided to make it the way they made it. So most likely not happening, you know. Those guys don't really like to compromise unless it's a compromise from internally, from internal, you know, an internal compromise. If it's, you know, governments and stuff telling them they can't do X, Y, and Z, they're definitely going to push back. So I don't expect to see the Cybertruck anytime soon in the UK, but if there was a possibility it could arrive here, I would be one of the first in line to try and buy one along with the fucking new shape Ford Bronco, which I absolutely fucking love. But again, whether that's going to happen is another case entirely. Whether that's going to happen is a fucking another case entirely. But big up yay, big up yay. Regardless, he was also at Disneyland um, hanging out with fucking young Leany's wife and a few other people. Um, what's with the Disneyland thing, by the way? I, I haven't been to America. I haven't been to Disneyland, but is it really that fun? People go to Disneyland like every single day, like it's a, like, or does it just have an amusement park in it? That's actually fun because I can't imagine going to a place like this so many times, you know, and having a good time. There has to come a moment where you kind of get bored over going on the same rides, going to the same things. Like, when does it get boring or does it never stay boring? Like, honestly, is it like a thing that it just, you know, you just continue having fun with it or there's a time where it kind of has to cap off because I personally wouldn't want to be going there all the time unless i'm with my kids or something and even with your kids like how many times can you go until you want to literally pull your hair out but maybe 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 i'm the one that's mistaken maybe i'm the one that's mistaken and clearly there is a generation and a collective of people out there who are adult disney fans right the ones who really start crying when they see fucking mickey or whatever so maybe they're the people that kind of keep this pace afloat because there's supposed to be a finite amount of kids that can have a have parents that can afford to go there have the time to go there and be one to go there um and maybe it is the actual adults who go there every other day to eat and drink who are actually keeping disneyland alive either way big up yay being at disneyland big up yay being at disneyland i want to play this clip but i'm not going to play it because obviously it's really graphic but i'm sure most of you have seen it it's a really heartbreaking clip um it features a guy who allegedly was trying to stop somebody from getting carjacked and then eventually his own car ended up getting carjacked by some dude and he was a construction driver i don't know some sort of like handyman pickup the dude and the guy tries to run away with his car and then the guy whose car it is um decides to start shooting in the car but i guess he wasn't confident he really wasn't about it he kind of was like almost aiming at him and not really kind of aiming for warning shots the guy in the car wouldn't stop he kept on driving his the guy's pickup truck and the guy for some reason had no spatial awareness had no kind of sense of danger he decided to just walk around and just like wait he should have went straight to safety should have ran straight into a building or something but for some reason he was feeling really safe he didn't really feel like the the rubber was going to do anything to him and of course the rubber then reverses the pickup truck and then like decides to ram the truck directly into that guy as he's standing in the way he just rams it directly into him knocks him flying obviously and the guy ends up unfortunately dying from his injuries so he went in being a good samaritan to help somebody and then he eventually ends up dying himself right because he got involved in this thing and for me personally it's another reminder as i said the other day of why most people should just mind their business I know it's mad to say this. I understand it's crazy because the guy just passed away. But similar to the story that I shared the other day about, you know, being embarrassed and being fucking cringed out and being fucking mocked by these women who I was trying to help the other day um, because I tried to be the fucking captain, you know, good guy, gentleman type type of dude and end up kind of blowing up in my face. Sometimes if you go into these type of things trying to be a good guy, it can sometimes blow in your face in a really big way. And in this guy's particular face, this guy's particular you know situation he had an opportunity sorry he had an opportunity to blow this guy's brains out right he could have literally murked this guy in his car but i guess he probably had second thoughts he has a heart he has empathy he has compassion so he didn't i think again maybe his aim is really bad but from where he's standing right there to where to the where the guy is which is essentially this passenger door right um um, american cars are left-hand drive so the guy is literally sitting here unless he's leaning down on a chair or something even though he should be able to aim and hit him here 
it shouldn't be that hard this car isn't bulletproof he can easily hit at the doors and hit the guy and he's fucking dead just empty his fucking clip into him but i think he didn't want to do it which is why he purposely fired behind and kind of around him and not at him but of course he spared the guy's life there but the guy when he went when it became his turn to ram the car into him he didn't spare the guy's life you know that's a really sad bit about it like he spared his life but then when it came to his life being you know spared didn't get spared and luckily the video there's a thing in front so when the guy gets hit you don't see the actual car rolling on top of him because i'm assuming apart from getting hit with that kind of impact what actually probably killed him is a car rolling over him as it kind of as he laid on the floor and it's a really sad video because i don't think people realize until the end that, that the guy's dead and they and i think when the other guys walk up to him especially this guy he starts waving because he sees the guy he's probably discombobulated his arms are probably in a different directions his knees are probably inwards like it's all going over the place and luckily the guy got arrested who drove into him so uh, hopefully he goes down for many years and you know thoughts and feelings and prayers go out to the guy who passed away um he did try to do a good thing and he ended up paying the ultimate price you know he ended up paying the fucking ultimate price but again like i said yesterday about my situation in the gym and other situations i think for the most part people need to fucking mind their business if you don't mind your business this is what ends up happening you try to be a good samaritan and then you ended up going out in this horrible way so r.i.p to this young man for trying to help somebody and then getting his own pickup truck nicked and then getting run over with his own pickup truck and then dying like fucking hell what a horrible way to go but bloody hell if this is not a lesson about minding your business i don't know what will i don't know what will i really fucking don't know what will moving on from that one we've got this this is a fucking really insane clip i'm gonna play you it features some north carolina police officer who groped a woman's boobs as he was arresting her and now the woman's obviously going to sue and you know they're going to try and see what i um i have a feeling like all police you know around the world they're going to investigate this this fucking horrible situation um in-house and then they're going to come to the conclusion that the police officer did nothing wrong he might get some he might get some suspended time off but that'll be it but this is a pretty crazy clip let me play this for you this is legitimately one of the most wild things i've ever seen and obviously courtesy of reddit north carolina police officer grubs a drunk woman's boobs rubs his hand on her butt between her legs during a pat down after she's arrested for a dwi all right what does dui and dwi what's the difference between that isn't d dwi driving while intoxicated and dwi is driving under the influence what's the difference between influence and intoxicated is influence to mean drugs and intoxicated means drinking is that why but how do they know if you're drunk or if you're high i guess they test you when you're on the street but when you blow isn't that to see your alcohol levels it does not really to see what drugs you're taking right can they do roadside drug tests is that possible can they pull you over and see if you're like on drugs like on in person or is that something they have to do after the fact because this is pretty wild oh alcohol okay so young old vibe saying alcohol v drugs okay cool let's play the video it's pretty insane pretty pretty insane on September 25th, Raleigh police officers approached a 26-year-old woman at a gas station on St. Mary's Street, saying they suspected her of drunk driving. One officer searched her after she was handcuffed. Anything on you that I got to worry about? I don't have anything. Nothing that's going to poke a stick me. The woman's attorney, Karen Griffin, said she was appalled when she received the video from the district attorney's office as part of the evidence in the case. On the officer's body camera, you can see him unzip her jacket. Jesus I've never seen Christ. an officer touch my client's breasts. Jesus Christ. Shake them. I appreciate your cooperation. You got anything just, in your pockets? No, I don't have anything. Then the officer <sighs> moved to the woman's shorts. First, he touched her backside. Can you face the car and yeah, step your feet absolutely. apart for me? What do you need? Step your feet apart for me. A little further. And that he made her turn and face the vehicle asked her to spread her Whoa. Legs first, then asked her to spread them first oh my god <laughs> jesus christ this guy's a fucking creep if you're not seeing the video he le he makes a girl face the car so her back is turned to him he makes her spread her legs and then he taps he rubs the inside of her legs and then literally does like a card swiping motion inside a vv or like outside like god almighty the weird thing is isn't he there with other police officers why what why didn't they intervene didn't they see what was happening why didn't they come in and be like oh 
relax, bro. What are you doing? Why was he allowed to do this? What? Where the brothers? Where is? Where is his colleagues? Are they all on their phones? Further, and ran his hand in between her legs. Are you probing for evidence, contraband, or a weapon? Pete Rubino was a police officer for 30 years and is now the vice president of the Carolina Safety Resource Group, which consults with law enforcement agencies. I've never seen an extensive search like that of somebody for a DWI. Rubino says it could come down to training. Wow. If that officer really believes it's reasonable to do that, he or she might need to look at procedures again. But Griffin is convinced it's about more than that. In your opinion, is this a sexual assault? Yes. I had no other opinion from the moment that I viewed it. Unfortunately, searches incident to arrest are invasive by their nature uh, in order to make sure that the officer is protected. It's a matter of officer safety. Wake County District Attorney. So it's looking like he might get off this. Again, police around the world are fucking wild, but American police might be, might be, might be the pinnacle. Because can you imagine this ever making sense that you need to like cup a woman's bum like this like to search her fucking backside like in this manner is there any need for it in the slightest like the way he runs his hands over her bum there's a bit where he grabs her breast and he's you can't really see it on the body cam but he's clearly shaking her breast and it's like bro if you want if we really want to see if she's got anything under her boobs i'm sure there's a way to do it where you do it with like the back of your hands with some level of dig giving the person some level of dignity while you're doing it also i know you know you shouldn't be thinking about that because you're pissed officer, but you sh there should be a way to kind of search somebody with the back of your hands and not fucking be cupping her boobs like you're her fucking gay best friend and shaking them up and down that is madness bro and he's with his colleagues too look it's not only him that's him in there he's with not old, okay, look he's with two other colleagues and they just let him what this is what they do in recent so so maybe i'm, I'm assuming because they are because you guys i don't know why you have so many people maybe we have the same thing in america in the uk again because i don't drive maybe this is a common thing here too but for some reason you have a lot of people in america who love to like do drugs and get in front of a camera do drugs get behind the wheel i don't know why people love to do that whenever i'm i've done drugs or i'm doing drugs the last thing i want to do is be in front of a camera or being or be behind a wheel or even be on my fucking bicycle i want to be laying down i want to be in a chair somewhere sipping a drink listen to some music i don't want to be like you know have all this stimuli and for some reason there are some freaks out there that get behind the wheel with the first thing i wonder if this is a common thing with police because they're all fucked anyway the, the people they're stopping they're either drunk or they're high they're probably thinking most of them won't remember if they do remember it's going to be admissible in court because they're under the influence no one's going to take their testimony seriously unless there's body cam footage and if there is body cam footage you can still contest it <clears throat> Because technically you can say they were belligerent, they were drunk, they were sloppy. I was trying to protect myself as a police officer because I guess in, in again, I'm just speaking out loud. I don't know what I'm talking about here. But I would imagine in like police procedures, when a policeman stops you, <clears throat> their safety has now become the priority. Like in their interactions, they're the ones that are the, the ones that should be looked, they're the ones that should be looked after. So if you if you pose a threat, they need to neutralize you. I think that's what happens in interactions. I would assume. So in this particular situation, they they've identified somebody who might be a problem, who might be a risk, and then I guess in their heads, what they're doing justifies them doing it because it's making sure that they're safe and that they can go home to their kids at night. I'm assuming, but fucking hell, bro, this guy was legitimately going fucking brazy. Like, this particular bit is where, like, okay, cool. Now you're, like, the fact that he's isolating her and taking her away somewhere, away from fucking prying eyes is another thing. He un The unzipping of the jacket, the way he did it. Um, Camera, you can see him unzip her jacket. I have never seen an officer. Then I guess he gra he's grabbed, like, look, that's a full breast grab. That's a full fucking breast grab right there. He's shaking them. Shake them. I appreciate your cooperation. Yes. And then he rubs a bum like four times. He rubs a no, bum I here. Then rubs the a bum there. Moved to the woman's shorts. First, he touched her back. And then he makes her rubs. And then he makes her rubber. He makes rubs a bum again when he spits her legs off. Step your feet apart for me. <laughs> Step your feet apart for me. A little further. And that he made her turn and face the vehicle. <laughs> Honestly, this is insane. 
this is literally insane. And the thing is, he's not going to get any charges. I guarantee you this guy gets no punishment for this. Zero punishment. Like, he's literally running his hands in between her legs with his body cam on. It looks like a POV video, like, of you know, from a Zorn site. It's like, bruh, don't you have any composure? Aren't you aware that the little camera's on? <clears throat> Honestly, thank God for body cams. Imagine what police officers were getting away with before body cams. Can you believe that? Imagine what police officers were getting away with without body cams. When body cams weren't around, imagine what they were getting away with. It must have been like... Do you know when criminals say, oh, I would love to have gone back to the 70s, 80s, 90s, when CCTV wasn't as prevalent or whatever, or readily available, and you could get away with doing crime, right? You can get away with getting, you know, get away with some fucking pre audacious, you know, um, thefts and whatever. Imagine what police were getting away with before body cams were introduced, before smartphones became widespread, actually, because smartphones as well are another one, right? Some random person across the road could be filming you taking the piss out of somebody. But imagine, before smartphones and CCTV became accessible, police probably got away with so much shit. So much shit to probably get away with. Because this is insane. Asked her to spread her legs apart, then asked her to spread them further, and ran his hand in between her legs. Are you probing for evidence, contraband, or a weapon? Are you probing <laughs> nothing? What, what weapons are you going to find in between a puss like that? I'm sure it does exist. I'm sure there's some psycho women who do put guns up up and up their snatch. But God almighty, bro. Like, honestly, what a fucking psycho. But yeah, uh, police around the world, absolutely corrupt, absolutely horrible people. Um, again, procedurally doesn't make any sense. Will he get any, rep you know, will he get any consequences for his actions? Probably not because people are fucking awful. That being said, that being said, on the topic of people being awful, have you guys seen this video? Have you guys seen this fucking video? This is pretty fucking wild. Can you imagine how embarrassed you would be? Number one, having to go into a vape shop. Number two, going to, into a vape shop that's also a mobile phone shop and then trying to steal a mobile phone. And then three, having the owners of that vape slash mobile phone shop catch you red-handed and then lock you in the store and wait for the police to come. And now you're screaming through the door for bystanders to help you. And they get told, oh, no, they're there because they, they stole something. Can you imagine how embarrassing this scenario is? Look how embarrassing this is. She's screaming. She's screaming. And there's a massive cut. There's a massive, obviously, group of kids outside looking. And these girls are inside the shop going crazy because they've been caught stealing and the owner's not letting them out i love the fucking stickers on the phone eid special eid spe and the funny thing is these are reg these are asian girls also right like you know I, I don't know what 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 would you call that part of india is that southeast asia that can't be that's central asia i don't know india pakistan whatever right so they're the, they're from the same community same area of the world and there's a sticker that says eid sale on these phones so imagine, people that look like you are the ones that always do you the dirtiest. They're in the store. They're going crazy like... That's the thing about... That's the thing I've always said. Oh look, they're going to the tills trying to make them do something, give up something. They're trying to get out. They're not being able to be let out. And they're screaming. They're absolutely screaming and going crazy. That boy looks like his shirt's been ripped. Maybe holding the girls back. They want to get let out, but they're not being let out. And one of them is actually, one of the girls has a Nike tech suit on. Nike tech suits are like, you know, Black Air Force Ones in clothing. So you know what time she's on, right? This girl's got a fucking Nike tech suit on. You know what time she's on. What, when have you ever seen like an Indian Pakistani girl wearing a Nike tech suit? That's when you know she's on fucking timing. So clearly that's an issue there. But I've done my, you know, I've done my fair share of fucking five sing five finger discounts over the over my time of life living on this fucking planet. And one thing that I've realized is that this is kind of a shitty rule because I think I'm probably making it up in my head. But I honestly think you should only do this type of shit in like 
big corporation stores like you know you go to a fucking target or whatever and you you know you don't have the money for a particular item whether it's something especially something that you actually need to eat with or to kind of keep you alive fair enough little five finger discount is what it is big corporation who fucking gives a shit but trying to go to like a a regular person's independent store where they sell vape pens and mobile phones are trying to steal from them especially when they're people from your own community that's kind of bottom down shit and even that being said I feel like there's like a level of karmic retribution that happens to you if you're suffering and you try and steal. I think there's something in there. I think when you actually have the money to afford it, but you just can't bother to save, you don't want to spend your money. I think that's when you're playing with you're playing with fire. I think you should only, if you're gonna dabble in five finger discounts, do it when you're really down bad. When you're really down bad, you have no other option. You're literally struggling. You, you know, you got no one to bail you out. Okay, cool, maybe. But to do this with random people who are just trying to make a living for themselves, I think it's some real sick shit. Like, you're a real piece of shit if you do that. Real, real piece of shit. So I don't have any sympathy for them for being caught the way they got caught. And now they're screaming, they're going crazy. They're probably on the phone. I don't know who she's on the phone with. Maybe they, maybe they, maybe they're they're trying to force the police to get there because they feel like they they're gonna get abducted and you know abused by these Asian dudes because you know there's bad reputations around you know groups of young Asian men unfortunately. But I think this is in, this is just incredible. It's an incredible fucking picture. Look at these girls. Look how look look at the fright. Look at the fright and the franticness, the anxiety on their faces because now they've been caught red-handed and they've been you know stuck inside of a shop there's nothing more embarrassing than this nothing more embarrassing than this i can't imagine you're screaming excuse me excuse me it's mad because this girl's talking she's in a phone shop and she's got an iphone 14 herself it looks like a pro max as well She's got an iPhone 14. She looks like she's been washed and showered. She's got some makeup on. Her friends look like they've been washed and showered. Also, it's like, what are you stealing in there, girl? Like, you don't need to steal. You have the money to buy the things that you want to buy. You just probably don't have it right now or you don't want to save, but you're not damn bad that you need to do this. And now you guys look nuts. They're pacing around the shop. The owners are looking at them. And they're doing a good job, the guys. They're just not touching them. They close the door and they're just not touching them. That's a really good thing. Because you, you, the last thing you want is the police to get there and these girls to write another fucking soliloquy about how they were abused. Like, no, no, no. I'm not going to touch you. You're just not going to leave the store. You know what I mean? Until the police get here. You're not leaving the store. Respect. <laughs> Now they're pleading with them. Oh, oh, they're shaking. <laughs> you fucking psychos. Look at that. Why are you recording? Look, this girl's got a Nike. This girl, you know, she's dangerous. She's got a Nike Tech hoodie on with no matching pants. She's got jeans on. If you're, if you're a girl and you have a Nike Tech top, with just some jeans on you're on some bad timing you're a fucking fug you you i have to hide my wallet i have to hide my coin purse i've got to hide my satchel you're a bad girl <laughs> they don't know what to do <laughs> i will smash the door i'm not gonna lie i'm smashing the door it's not that hard man just couldn't you smash the door if you wanted to? Like, actually, because it's glass. If she kept running into it, could she just smash it? If you're that desperate. But I guess she doesn't want to get cut up, right? So you want to get let out, but you don't want to get a scar on your face. But if you really wanted to go, couldn't you just run full pelt? Run full fucking pelt. And just, like, with the corner of your fucking arm and just hope for the best. Just burst out of the fucking thing like a fucking wrestler or something. And just run all the way home from there, covered in blood and glass. Not looking suspicious at all. <laughs> Open. Help us. Okay, they don't, they don't look Asian to me. Now I've seen them up close. They don't look like they're from the same community. They look like they might be um, Middle Eastern. Right? They look like they could be Middle Eastern or maybe a bit east of that. But they don't look like they're from Pakistan or India. I thought they were fellow people from their same places, but they don't. They look a little bit more of the lighter complexion, a little bit more European features. Either way, 
they're embarrassed. Where's your money? <laughs> what are they Pakistani? Who's who she calling on the phone? Nothing's gonna happen, bro. You're in the shop, you're locked until the police can arrive. Absolutely boss fucking. But again, there's. I don't think, you know, I've only had, I think, one occasion where somebody pulled me aside for maybe slipping some shopping into my bag that I shouldn't have slipped into it. And it's way more embarrassing when that happens than, you know, anything else because you still have to pay for it anyway. And then everyone sees you, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's super embarrassing. But at least then they just let you pay for it and tell you to go and never come back or something. But in this, Getting locked in a shop like this, I can't imagine anything more embarrassing. Legitimately, I can't imagine. This is the type of thing where you want the whole ground to swallow you up. You don't even want to be alive anymore. But again, maybe just don't steal, you know? Maybe just don't steal. Maybe maybe the thing to sort out that whole entire situation is just don't steal. Could that be possible? Is that all it takes? Just don't steal. Who knows? Anyways, moving on, moving fucking on. So this is a really interesting article courtesy of The Guardian talking about how Britain's staycation boom may be over. I'm surprised. Not, of course. But allegedly, there was a boom. I think it was around just after the pandemic or around the pandemic where people were looking for places to go because they were fed up of staying at home all day and we couldn't travel abroad. So, um, you know, places around the UK were becoming way more in demand to go and travel to and have your little vacations. But I think we all kind of collectively forgot why we don't do that anyway especially Londoners or maybe everybody forget London no I think London specifically because London's a shit city overall I think if you live outside of London you probably enjoy the UK better because you have you know you have a lot of countryside you have a lot of hikes you can go on different type of areas and shit I think up north you have a you have the ability to go to different types of you have the ability to enjoy different types of sceneries in the UK there's only one scenery and that's like concrete right nothing else but concrete but i think other parts of the uk you get to mix it up a bit anyway londoners for a long time you know i kind of looked down upon because we're not really that you know clued up on other parts of the uk myself included we don't really travel outside of the uk much outside of london much so that's why we all kind of tend to go outside of the uk when we go on our holidays but when covid happened we didn't have the option to do that so we had to vacation at home and that became a big thing but we soon realized why we don't do it because it's really expensive it's so insane that in some occasions it's more expensive to book a return ticket from london where i am to manchester than it is to go from where i am right now in london to madrid to barcelona to paris to lille to lisbon to porto to budapest to krakow i swear you could get a return flight from london to krakow over the weekend that will cost less than you taking a train from London to fucking Liverpool. That's how crazy it is. And don't get started on like Airbnbs and hotels, UK wise, fucking nuts how expensive they are. So it's really pricey when you start to figure out, oh, I want to go to Bournemouth. I want to go to Bath. I want to go to Dorset. I want to go to Bristol. I want to go to Devon. All these are fucking lovely places, right? Nottingham, Leeds, whatever. But the trip tickets, the flights are quite expensive or the train tickets are really expensive, which is why we most of us tend to go to Europe, other places of Europe. But the other really far, the other really fucked up thing about it is that because a lot of us don't travel within our, you know, our shores, that doesn't help the economy outside of London. So all the money is focused, all the resources are focused in London. The government, quote unquote, head headquarters, all the government things are run through London. So up north and surrounding counties, whatever, you know, they all get ignored. So those places don't have as much money pumped into them as London do because people don't travel and go and share things there, which is really sad because one of the reasons why people are really looking forward to the HS2 trains, right, that got cancelled, when those HS2 trains, um, when that HS2 line, sorry, was cancelled, that's what a lot of people are really pissed off about because the HS2 would have been an amazing thing because it would have connected parts of London to parts of the midi to the middle of england to the north very quickly so that you could have had people legitimately commuting from manchester to london to work or deciding to move 
their job or whatever to other parts of the UK because they had a high speed rail. But the high speed rail got got cancelled last minute, you know, because the UK government is fucking bullshit. But essentially, this high speed rail would have legitimately changed the entire fabric of this country and really spread the wealth across the, the you know across from like you know the south all the way up to the north. But now it's all contrary down here, which is probably why the staycations have completely you know bottled down because it's just too expensive to travel so let's actually read the article itself it says is britain's staycation boom over short-term holiday rentals experienced a surge in recent years especially during the pandemic when britain stayed at home in the uk leading to a spike in the rates however holiday let owners across the uk are reporting a significant fall in bookings so far this year as the sector feels the effects of the cost of living crisis poor weather and increasingly saturated market I'll just say it's a return to people normality. I just say a regular person, no matter how much money you have, if somebody offers you a 200 euro ticket to go from London to Paris for the weekend or a 150 price ticket to go from here to Newcastle, you're going to pick Paris. So that's the real issue at hand. Even if though, you know, Paris is still so expensive to live and to kind of do your day to day shit. No one was no one in their right mind would choose going to Paris over the weekend for two hundred pounds, then going to Newcastle one fifty. Makes no sense. It continues. Helen Angle, fifty eight, manager director of Woodland Collection Hills Holidays in, in Townsend, Cornwall, about ten miles from the tourist hotspots of St Ives, said the demand in January and February fell by eighty percent. Bro, people who run hotels and shit like what a horrible business in one side. Because if the mood changes, the trend changes, your business is done and you have nothing, there's nothing you could do about it. You can't cut prices, you can't do renovations to attract more people, you don't have the money to attract more people and if you do do it, you're just going to be in the hole for more. Like running a hotel is like a risky business, isn't it? Like if the market changes, you are fucked. 80%, full, fucking hell. This year, we had uh, uh, hardly any bookings at all in January or February. March and April bookings are down by 20%. She attributes much of the sluggish demand to poor weather. So many people are fed up with the wet weather. They are going abroad to get some sunshine. The second big factor is the massive oversupply of holiday lets. A lot of people thought that they could make easy money because of what happened during COVID. I think that's true, partly. But I just think in general, it's just too expensive to travel in the UK. It just is. It's just always been crazy expensive. Like the Airbnbs in some locations in the UK will literally make your eyes bleed. Like in Dorset, Devon and shit. You could easily rack up a thousand pound for like a shit, you know, not a shit area. But it's like, bruh, this isn't the Shea, this isn't the, the Shea Shells. This isn't Florence. Do you know what I mean? Like what? This isn't fucking Valencia, you know? What the hell? It continues. They are supplied by Air, DN Air DNA, which tracks listing and holiday rentals on sites like Airbnb and v Viabo, um, found that 342,000 short-term lets available in the UK in 12 months were up 19% of previous years. New listing code homes in the UK jumped 22%. Yvonne um, Turnbull, 58, who lives in Horsham, West Sussex, has been letting out her three-bedroom apartment in Scarborough, North Yorkshire, for between 150 and 175 including airbnb for the past six years she said demand was significantly down on previous years with no bookings for january february or march including half term fewer bookings over the easter turnbull says that scarborough has now oversupplied with lets when we started there were 200 airbnbs in town now you're looking at 1000 god damn so maybe there is an over demand oversupply and not enough demand for the supply jesus christ nor is the problem um limited to seaside destinations vive which offers short-term rentals has seen a 21 percent drop in bookings across the uk or london sorry more than 500 properties properties from january to 19th of march since the same period of last year the lack of bookings is another hit on the holiday let industry after the government introduced um increased regulation and announced a tax relief from april 200, 2025 um new controls on holiday lets in england will be introduced this summer including a mandatory national registration scheme and councils be given greater powers if they want to use short-term lengths martin dunford founder of accommodation sites cool places says inquiries for uk self-catering accommodation were slightly down from last year but higher than before the pandemic we're finding that people are more careful they have less money tend to book later watch the weather and try to get more out of their money okay this is probably this probably makes a lot of sense 
I would it, it I would really believe a scenario where a lot of people, are, even some of you guys that don't live in the UK, I could imagine a lot of you are probably travel fatigued. I know I am. I never was that guy, but I don't look forward to the plane journeys anymore. Not because of the journey of the plane, just the whole hassle. Getting to the airport, the immigration thing, waiting for your fucking flight to board, getting on, walking on the thing, waiting to sit down, putting your thing on the top, the whole fucking shebang with the fucking emergency, whatever thing when the plane crashes, on your flight. It's just, it's taxing, right? It's literally a day worth of fucking activities you're doing and it's super super draining um so i don't look forward to the actual travel part of the holiday the holiday itself i look forward to i don't really mind coming back either i don't really get holiday blues like that i just don't like the actual travel itself so maybe there are a lot of people in the uk who just who would rather spend the extra money to travel in the uk and not have the hassle of having to pack a bag a luggage a certain way separate all their fucking you know aerosols and not have any fucking creams of a certain you know millimeter um, sorry a, a certain fucking weight that they can't put in their bag having to pay extra money for the baggage if it goes overweight all this sort of shit it's just stressful it's just annoying so i can understand a scenario where people are willing to spend the extra money just to not put up with that hassle me personally i couldn't do it because i love you know the ability to go abroad and enjoy myself and let my hair down and not be in this fucking you know shit of a country but i see how people are doing it it continues miriam vangus um 60 her husband have run a one-bedroom holiday cottage in the 18 acre small holdings of st Clair's in wales for the past 17 years she said people were demanding a lot more for their money they expect more of a hotel experience now we see a huge number of requests for hot tubs <laughs> wood burners which seem to be deal breakers trend change that's insane imagine you're booking a, a little cottage somewhere and you're requesting that they have a hot tub and a fucking wood burner people are fucking insane with their requests man what you see on my listing is what i have for, i've got fucker do you want to rent my place or not if you don't fuck off a wood burner or a hot tub she added um we have considered long-term letting and that's something we may revisit um selling up may become a necessity depending on whether things pick up but yeah our staycations in the uk are completely down i understand it um i'm due to go to Wuppertal in germany very soon at the end of may and so far the entire trip is going to cost me including um you know flights and accommodation probably 300 pounds and i don't think i can get i don't think there's a single place i could go to in the uk that's nice right not just a shit old place that i could go to for the weekend that's 300 pounds i don't think so maybe for the day i could find one for or maybe for two nights but for the weekend as in you got you you know you arrive on friday leave on monday it doesn't exist that's how crazy it is so i'm taking my money i'm spending it abroad which obviously is hurting our economy and fucking up you know um local economy in general and obviously not helping quote-unquote tourism but you know it is what it is it kind of is what it blood clot is moving on we got this interesting clip courtesy of the art of dialogue it features eddie griffin saying the raids on diddy's homes for sex trafficking were staged and he believes that clive davis and the head of universal music group are somehow involved this to me is a clear example of that thing i remember my parents telling me ages ago i think it might be my dad something along the lines of oh just because you're older doesn't mean you're smarter or you're wiser like age doesn't be you know beget fucking wisdom they're two completely separate things just because you've been on the earth longer doesn't mean you're smarter or you know what you're talking about and i think this is another example of it but then it also is another example of the weird self-induced paranoia conspiracy theory laden syndrome a lot of older black dudes have with this diddy thing and i wonder if it's like a if it's a guilty conscious because maybe they took part in some of the free coughs maybe they did their own free coughs back in the day but i've noticed a certain caliber a certain age bracket boomer black dude industry veteran they have some very bizarre takes when it relates to the fucking diddy thing like super insane like legitimately like you're, you're thinking hold on like is this guy okay does he have all his faculties like why is he saying this and i'm beginning to wonder is this a guilty conscious are these guys actually redacted like what's actually going on here let me play this clip for you so you can see what's going on but i swear to god this legitimately is one of the most insane clips i've ever seen because this guy seems to be quite smart 
but he's actually talking out of his ass. So this is Eddie Griffin, legendary comedian and obviously comedic actor, talking about the Diddy shit. Clive Davis, yeah, that's 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 the monster, and the 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 head of Universal Music Group. What's this motherfucker's name? See, see, he's um put Diddy up, and, and they 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 sacrificing Diddy. They, they they said, nigga, you gotta take this shit, cause we ain't we 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 can't be involved. But Diddy smart. He filmed every fuck session. So he was fucking Clive and the motherfucker and freak boy that run uh, Universal Music Group. So he got them on some fuck tapes. Now that's why they raid in the house because they got. So Diddy was smart because he fucked the guys that were trying to blackmail him, recorded it while also allegedly raping people and while allegedly also involving himself in sex trafficking. He was smart though. Okay, let's keep on going friends in Homeland Security and the feds and they said get, get in there and get them tapes from this nigga he trying to blackmail us that's what I believe is going on because you know how he, he's even got old man voice right he's even got that old man cadence that accent he even sounds like an older dude he probably isn't even that old I wouldn't imagine but he sounds like a fucking dinosaur talking absolute shit Homeland Security, they came in there with tanks down there, motherfucking uh, military motherfuckers, 25 deep, 30 <laughs> deep for one dancing nigga. Say what? One yeah. dancing nigga. That one dancing nigga has been accused of some pretty heinous crimes, Eddie Griffin. He's not been accused of, you know, some white collar shit. He's not been accused of running a couple red lights. He's not been accused of, you know, a couple of five finger discounts in Target. He's been allegedly accused of grape you know people trafficking other drug offenses some other shit it's pretty heavy charges again they're just charges they're just, you know at the moment nothing's been proven or no they're not even charges they're what people have been, have been saying in you know in what is in lawsuits actually you know accusations in lawsuits not actually charged no actual charges have been brought against him just yet but i wonder what this what these guys will say will their tunes change if and when diddy does get charged you gonna have 50 goddamn troops at his goddamn mansion. It's not Suge Knight, it's Diddy, y'all. He gonna dance him to death? I mean, what the fuck? Properties owned by Diddy were within yesterday by Homeland Security as part of an ongoing... Also, this is a very boomer setup, isn't it? He's watching the laptop on his laptop. He's got a massive giant screen behind him, a TV that's probably way too big for his stature and the room. It makes him look like a fucking... Like, a, like literally like a midget. Um, it's all over the place. So maybe the setup tells you everything about what type of shit this guy's going to be talking. Now, isn't it ironic that, you know, HSI's there, the military motherfucking What's ironic about that? security is, man, this is anyway. Is that how that works? The militarization of the police department has just gotten out of fucking hand. If there's one thing that black people, especially a particular age bracket black people know to talk about, it's police they have a we seem to have a real encyclopedic knowledge about police procedures you know all this sort of nonsense right you can quote that shit like the back of our hand but you know ask some of these motherfuckers to balance a checkbook ask some of these motherfuckers about you know ices and shit ask some of these motherfuckers about stocks and other types of investments ask them about property at taxes you know ask them about you know details about being a fucking landlord business owner no no information but when it comes to fucking talking ad nauseum about the you know police what what, what did he call it what, what's a phrase that they like to use all the time they love to fucking overuse that phrase the militarization of the police department it's like come on man hey okay, motherfucking homeland security is man, militarization anyway. the militarization of the police department has yeah. just gotten out of fucking Shut hand now these motherfuckers got on army gear like they going to war at somebody's mansion all right now part two of this i mean what 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 the fuck what the fuck you gonna tear up the man's house it's just it's just and you didn't put shit back to where you you, you where you found it you, you sons of bitches you sons of bitches you sons of bitches i want to know who told the camera crews that they were going down there to raid his house isn't Diddy a not worthy celebrity? Isn't it happening in LA and Miami, all these other places? Leaks happen. How do you think they get hold of police reports, mugshots? Like, come on, bro. Like, use your brain. 
they already set there's up. Some, there's some big conspiracy to bring Diddy down. Like, it's not that deep. He's a high profile figure. He's very famous. He lives in a, you know, a pretty baked place anyway. People probably knew his address before his house got raided. It wasn't like it was a secret. Like, what's this guy talking about? Had the motherfucking satellites, the helicopters, and all, all over the top, nigga, to get the aerial view. I mean, you know, just to, you know, sensationalize the story. This is what I'm saying. Somebody's behind this shit. It's staged, right? <laughs> it's staged. Because if you get, you get, your house gets raided by the feds and it's staged. Who's it staged by? Fair enough, say this about fucking Jeffrey Epstein. Cool. But did he? What's Diddy now? Is he like a member of the fucking Israeli special forces or something? Is that what you're trying to say? Fucking Diddy was in Mossad. All right. If it's really just a, a quick, fast hit on the motherfucker's property, nigga, you ain't going to call the press and say we about to hit Puffy's crib. You're just going to hit the crib. No, you're going to do that because you're going to bring attention and you're also going to put pressure on the person that you're trying to, you know, languish for something. Maybe he might run. That might force your hand. It's a good tactic, actually, especially with somebody's high profile, to blast it all over the media like this. You want to either catch them by surprise or you want to let everybody know ahead of time to see what they do as a reaction. And judging by what we saw, I think Diddy did try to run, but I think his lawyers told him to come back. I think when we saw him on the plane the same day his house got raided, he happened to leave early in the morning to jump on his jet to go somewhere in the fucking Caribbean. I think he did try to run. But his lawyers were able to talk sense into him. Somebody in his family told him, hey, take a deep breath. Wherever you are, stop right now. Let me speak to you. And kind of ran him through the play. And was like, look, unless they, unless they charge you with something, this is going to look fucking crazy. And you're going to look even more guilty than what you probably already are. Come back home right now. And he did. And then guess what he did when he came back home? He was dancing. He was being super visual, visible. He was riding his bike along the streets and stuff like a regular civilian. Like, come on, man. I think he did try and run away, but somebody luckily told him to come back and he listened. And they just don't have to hear about that through the grapevine and rush down there as quick as they can. But no, we seen the aerial shot of them driving up and arriving at this motherfucker's crib. Somebody's behind it. Somebody way up the ladder. And I think that ladder is the head of Universal Music Group. They really wanted to be a big conspiracy because I think part of them wants to look smart because they've broken it down and they also want somebody that they look up to to be so important that the head of universal music group want to bring him down and biden and the electoral college and Zelensky. they want to tie it to all these nonsense things to make themselves appear smarter for breaking it down and to also give the person who they're talking about a bit of props because it's like, oh, this person we look up to, they're obviously a big deal because look what they got involved in and look how it turned out. I think that's what's happening. Honestly, I think that's what's happening. It's odd, odd to say it. It really doesn't make any sense in some ways, but I think that's what we're seeing right now. These weird dudes are like getting, you know, oddly enjoying hearing the sound of their own voice while they talk about this nonsense. It's like, what the fuck is going on right here? What the fuck is going on right here? But anyway, Eddie Griffin, another proof that just because you're older, and again, how old is fucking Eddie Griffin? I actually want to check. How old is this motherfucker? Is he like 50 or 60? It doesn't prove at all just because you're older that you're fucking smart. You're not. He's 55 years old. Well, he sounds like he's fucking 75. So that makes a lot of sense that he's sounding like that. Eddie Griffin talking out of his fucking ass once again, talking out of his fucking ass once a fucking again. Moving on, we've got this really cool clip, courtesy of Tim Dillon on the Diary of the CEO, where he talks about wanting to live in London. And I have a, I have to admit, I agree a lot with his um, position and how he's kind of phrasing this. I've also had the same thoughts about living in London and buying a property here. I think I secretly have the hope um, that one day that I will buy a property here and then I'll leave. That's my major plan. My major plan is like, okay, cool. Once I actually have enough of the funds to buy a place, that might be the time that I then decide to leave. Because, you know, staying here, you know, all year round is hell in itself. So having the ability to leave um, after securing yourself a property is such a flex. And it's something that I would definitely, 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 100 million percent would love to do. I swear to God, I'd love to do that. So when I hear Tim Dillon talk about it the way he did talk about it on this pod, it kind of made me think, you know what? That's probably why I like the guy, because we definitely do think the same, even though we don't look the same. And whatever it may be, 
we definitely, 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 definitely do think the same. So let me play this clip for you here while I get it to load up and you can see what I mean because Tim Dillon definitely is onto something when he was talking about this. Let me get it up on the screen so you can see this. This is Tim Dillon on the diary of a CEO. One of our premier podcasts actually here in the UK. This guy's become, you, sorry, um... this guy's now become like the, the English version of like Joe Rogan. I'm not going to lie. It's become one of the most popular ones. It's actually overtaken True Geordie. This guy has actually overtaken True Geordie as like the main UK podcast to kind of go on. He gets a bunch of views. A lot of people in the UK don't really like him though, unfortunately. They think he's a bit of a lemon, but he's pretty cool. I don't mind him. I'm not going to lie. And you, um, I don't mind him in the slightest. So let me actually get this loaded for you so you can see it. But I, I really don't mind him in the slightest. I think he's pretty cool. But he actually did have a really cool interview with fucking Tim Dillon where he spoke about his stuff. Let's see if it's loading. It is. It's actually on. Is it on the screen yet? Can we get this on there? Nope. Let's put it there. Cool. Let's go. And you, um, hopefully, you. I, I think I heard you say you were thinking about potentially moving to London at one point. I want to. I'd love to own something in London. I like One Hyde Park, but it's very expensive. And the reason that I like it is because it's the most expensive residential real estate building in the world. No one really lives there, mm -hmm. but you see these young Saudi kids drive their Bugattis and stuff. And every now and then one or two lights is on. That's very true. There's a part also in Stratford that has the same sort of thing where there's these amazing buildings near Stratford, Westfield Centre. If you've been there, you'd know what I mean. Um, they're literally right next to the shopping centre. And I sometimes have been in Ubers on the way back home from that way. And you'll see, you always talk to Uber drivers. They always tell you how depressing it is coming around, um, how depressing it is to come around um, that area and drop people off because literally they'll pull up to, you know, amazing buildings and there'll be hardly any lights on in the building at like a perfect, you know, prime time where most people are meant to be home. And then you find out through some of the residents that a lot of those flats have been built by, sorry, have been bought by Russian people, other foreign people who just buy them and just kind of let them sit there. Maybe they let them out, maybe they don't, but no one actually lives there day to day. It must be quite wild to be neighbours, you know, in a building with people that don't actually live there. You're just there on your own. And it, to me, it symbolizes the utter coldness and emptiness of having things. And I think there's a beauty to that. There's something very interesting about it. You know, that whole city of London really interests me. And I don't mean the city of London. I mean that city of London, that city within a city, which most people don't know about. But there's a great article in Vanity Fair. Read it or don't. The point is that whole area of Knightsbridge is very interesting to me. I'm actually going to break that article down next time I do a podcast, actually. I don't know if you remember that one, City of Inner City, because of Vanity Fair. I mean, One Eyed Park is interesting because the, the banality and the hollowness of extreme wealth really shocks me. We, we tend to, and listen, we know the rich are doing crazy things, right? The mega rich, they crazy, the yachts, the this, the mm -hmm. that, the Epstein stuff, a lot of it, mm -hmm. not good, regrettable. We understand it. <laughs> There's also an element I think people don't understand, and that's the banality, how boring how it, it passionless a lot of people are at that level of and that's always made me you would uh, like to join the knightsbridge crowd i i well I, to, to observe you know they'll never let me in that's the other thing i love about i'm addicted to rejection right since i'm six i've been auditioning and have no no so they'll never let me in but it's just fun to kind of look at and you don't even want to be in per se because it's not fun that's the thing it's not really that fun but it is funny to me when i look at like you know the secrecy and how you know, some of it really yeah, is really bad and people are doing crazy things and they're overthrowing governments and it, that's probably 10% of them. And then 90% of them, it's just they're fighting extreme suffocating boredom. That's the truth, but I want some of that boredom. I want to be some of that boredom. And I think I've always had this kind of goal in my mind. I don't really, you know, apart from obviously, you know, buying a house for my parents and stuff as a thank you for, you know, putting up with me and my little brothers as we were kind of rampaging around the house, breaking everything, arguing all the time and fighting and shit. That's obviously a good way to go. I think when it comes to myself, I've never really had that much of a desire to have my own house apart from having one in London, just as a sign that I've had one, just to kind of represent all of the struggle, all the pain, all of the fucking suffering that you go through living in a city day to day. And I think the funny thing about London, probably similar to New York, it doesn't matter what level of the socioeconomic ladder you're on, the pain and suffering affects you all in different ways, of course, but you all suffer. There is no like, 
living in a bubble. It doesn't exist. So even people who do live in one Hyde Park, they still have to commute through London. They still have to go through dodgy parts to hit restaurants, to hit bars, to go to work, to go to meetings. It's all over the place. So I honestly do think um, the only you know, way to kind of reconcile that sort of shit and kind of make you feel at one is to obviously... <laughs> It's to obviously get yourself a property and then kind of it will make it almost all worth it, you know, because you've got something to show for me. And that's something I want to do because I've, like, like I said, I've literally promised myself as soon as I get that property here in London, I'm leaving this fucking godforsaken city. And I'll definitely go move to like another city up north, like Manchester or something. Um, I'd probably do that before I'd move to another location in London because I quite like the area of London I live in. I don't think it's that bad, but I also don't want to stay here long term. But having a property here that you can let or that you can, sorry, that you can rent out, that you can put up on Airbnb is fucking priceless because, you know, um, rates here are fucking crazy. And if you offer it, you know, a little bit under market value, you have people, you know, queuing up to stay in your home year round. I've heard it's not as easy as it sounds to, be a landlord and to have properties on airbnb you know tenants are fucking awful i go out of my way to be a pretty good airbnb guest i think i'm the kind of person that will clean up all my dishes that will take up that will take out the bin that will separate the glasses like if i don't have time i'll literally have all the glasses separated and shit you know what i mean i'm not gonna be fucking cooming all over the walls or pissing on the fucking walls or shitting on the walls but i know some people do do that so it's not as easy as it sounds to just kind of have a property open it up put an airbnb in and collect the money but still having that option being that having the ability to do that it's still a flex, you know, it's still a flex. So um, big up Tim Dillon, big up Tim Dillon. And again, I also would love to live in London one time. I think that one Hyde Park place he wants to live in is fucking gorgeous though, by the way, just to kind of show you what it looks like. I'm sure most of you have seen it. It's just a massive fucking building. There's also another one in, in Greenwich area next to the river that also is fucking awesome um, to check out that people kind of live by and it looks fucking beautiful and it kind of overlooks all the water. But one Hyde Park, obviously, you know, it's literally next to Hyde Park, which is basically our central park in here in London. And it's right in the center of London. You basically are a two minute walk away from Bond Street, Oxford Circus, all these amazing places and the properties themselves are fucking gorgeous as well so you can't really complain that people would go out of their way to kind of try and live in these public places let me see if there's actually can we actually see if there's one rooms oh look yeah there's actually one available there's one property in one Hyde Park actually available to check out on rightmove.com which is our version of you know Zoopla or whatever you got out there in the states so this is one of the properties listed again not the best view but this is probably one of the properties listed here this is it's for 5.5 million Wide Hyde Park in Knightsbridge in London. Let's see what this looks like. I'm not too fond of this view. This view is a bit mad because you don't actually see the street. You kind of see another building, you know? Not much of a view there, but still. Um, I think it all comes fully furnished, I'd imagine, right? If you're paying 5.5 million, you better give me all this gaudy, you know, Saudi Arabian looking furniture. That looks pretty cool. You got some indoor garage. There's a Bentley there, right? So you can see how, you know, what kind of wealth we're talking about sculptures on the outside look at the reception wow the reception area when you come into one hyde park looks like a hotel <laughs> i don't know about that though what do you guys think would you would you like to live in a an apartment block that looks like a hotel hmm i don't know i kind of want it to look kind of homely it looks a little bit too can i check in your bag you know the, the, it's ni nicely furnished, good space, nice sized kitchen, not the biggest again, for 5.5 million, I'd want the kitchen to be a bit more substantial, it looks a little bit, looks a little bit tight, isn't it? Looks a little bit tight, the, the kitchen. Living space in the dining room area is very clogged up, again, the glass and the mirror effects make it look really big, it does a good illusion, but it's quite cramped, there's a lot of, st maybe I'd get rid of a lot of the furniture, there's a lot of stuff here, I, mean, I, I might get rid of all this stuff, it's blocking all the way, there's not, Easy way to kind of walk through. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit gaudy. The, the, the interior design is very gaudy. Is there, is there a pool built in or is this, okay, I think this is like, I think this is all the communal stuff that you can share with people. There's a squash thing. There's a, there's a, there's a gym, obviously. That's fucking fantastic. You can play golf inside. There's a restaurant also in there. You can basically stay in your room all day, every day if you wanted to. Bathroom. Yeah, 5.5 million. That is not worth it, bro. That looks kind of shit. I'm not going to lie. 
interior design by Candy and Candy. This one bedroom, that's a one bedroom apartment. That's 5.5 million. One bed apartment. Wow. On the third floor, um, with 1,110 square feet, includes a very rare benefit of a 120 square feet storeroom, which is fitted with wardrobe, excellent ceilings, and apartment is a net gross internal area of 989 square feet. We understand it's one of the only two um, one-bedroom apartments in the building with a store basement storage, beautifully designed reception and dining room. I don't know, man. That doesn't look like a place that I'd want to live in. I'm not going to lie. A one-bedroom apartment for 5.5 million sounds like a fucking nightmare to me i'm not gonna lie that sounds like an absolute nightmare i'd want something a bit more substantial but again i understand why tim dylan want to live there he's he always wants to be at a seat of luxury so it makes a lot of sense why he definitely would be involved or interested in living in a place that looked like that but not for me not for me in the slightest not for me in the motherfucking slightest i'm not gonna lie i definitely 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 wouldn't want to live there like it just doesn't look that fun really it looks kind of good like again the interior design is the main thing that i don't like it looks too gaudy it looks way 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 too gaudy like it looks it looks like somewhere drake would want to live you know drake has a similar taste to this sort of stuff drake likes this sort of shit all this shiny glass fake marble effect stuff right like unnecessary lights everything cramped every other wall is mirrored like it's just yeah and the kitchen also is super tight like that's a very stingy kitchen for 5.5 mil that is a very stingy kitchen you gotta give me more kitchen than that for 5.5 mil like come on bro come on you have to give me more than that you have to give me more than that you have to you have to fucking give me more than that that doesn't look that great i'm not gonna lie not for me not for me in the absolute slightest i'm pretty much okay with that one I'm pretty much okay with that one. Okay, so we did this, we did that, we did this, we did that. We also want to end it with this article, courtesy of These Links, which talks about, um, I think These Links is this really cool newsletter that someone put together where there are these anonymous um, essays that people send, newsletters, where about things that they hate. Um, you know perfect because people in this world don't really have the capacity to speak at length about things they love but if you ask them about things they hate bloody hell they're gonna fucking chew your ear off so this is courtesy of the substack called these links d spelled d-e-e-z links l-i-n-k-s dot com check it out they've got a huge range of articles and you know blog posts some sub substacks that you can kind of check out this particular one the title is in berlin i experienced x i never thought possible so let's actually go through this one because this might be entertaining especially considering how much i love that city and i love particularly Berghain. so the subtitle is i hate berlin let's see what it says here before i moved to berlin i visited twice both trips were at the height of summer when the sun stayed out past 9 p.m and every park looked like a hobbiton back yard replent with checkered picnic blankets piles of mountain cheese and half liter beer bottles it was nice at least between june and september <laughs> yeah okay they started off hot this is very true they've started off hot it definitely is the best place to be june through september but the other months oh which is weird because i actually prefer to go to berlin outside of june and september because it's too warm i just can't handle it and that place doesn't have you know places don't have good air good, good air conditioning you know the beer is nice because usually most places have chilled glasses so you can enjoy a nice cool beer a nice cold beer but it's too warm for me so i like to go before june or after september but we digress there was always a cool club to try out and duh anywhere is affordable compared to new york but what I now know now is that deciding to move to Berlin purely based on the wide-eyed summer visits was kind of like watching, say, a movie trailer for a musical that doesn't make it clear that, by the way, this is a musical and now it's too late. Oh, <laughs> that's a brilliant analogy. That's a brilliant analogy because I, I could imagine the amount of people who move to Berlin based on the summers because literally the summers in Berlin are like summers in London. They're fucking magical. But the summers in London are not representative of your whole entire year experience in London at all. Zero. I think the same, same could be said for most cities around the world. But I think particular with Berlin and London being so dreary and wet, especially Berlin, it's actually way more. I think we're, we have a bit more of a soggier 
damp, you know, environment. But I think Berlin has a scenery where it's all grey. It's a very ugly city. Like I said, like the architecture is horrendous. Um, every other wall, like I don't know, graffiti. I don't think there's any rules in graffiti in Berlin. I think I remember here in London, there's like rules with graffiti where you're not meant to graph up residential homes and shit. Um, but it doesn't exist in in Berlin. People graph anything, anything with a wall gets fucking spray painted and they don't try and clean it off so everywhere looks like a fucking bomb site everywhere looks like a squat it's fucking crazy it continues granted moving anywhere involves a period of post u-haul clarity but i'm holding from um in the belief that berlin does not rightfully does not frightfully better no sorry let me continue that granted moving anywhere involves a period of post u-haul clarity but i'm holding firm on the belief that berlin does a frightfully better job of hiding its shortcomings than anywhere else it's been eight years since i've moved here and i'm still finding new things to cringe at every day take the white people here for instance i have possibly never seen so many white people with dreadlocks they are everywhere and they're always asking me things like, why can't I say the N-word if it's in a song? Or explaining how colorblind, how explaining how they're colorblind or wondering why their sushi tastes like weird. <laughs> why their sushi rice tastes weird. <laughs> and that's very true. You do find a lot of those kind of guys over there. Should you be able to shrug off the casual racism of these ultra modern liberal Berliners? You still won't escape the city's overlay of graffiti, which rather than convincing some quality of ambient cosmopolitan, um, rock sort of the dens, um, the soul, clip. Love is here. Graffiti is liberty. It's not giving counterculture so much as its sensibility of a boomer director of a legacy non-profit. In Berlin, I experienced X that I never thought possible. But the graffiti is still better than a state of advertisements. Blow job for free proclaims an ad for reusable bowls. A poster for a high ABV beer featuring a giant pink vagina promises to be the most illegal beer in the world. The other day, I wandered into an art gallery in the heart of Berlin and the exhibition du jour was an artist recording a recent orgy. <laughs> Brilliant Berlin, baby. This is a city infected with preteen ideas of being edgy. That's very true. They definitely think they're doing a thing when they have a model walk down the runway naked or when they have some guy walking down the street in just a pair of sandals or when the artwork itself is a fucking, you know, a, a pudding on the floor with a spoon that looks like it's been covered in shit. Like, and it's just fucking, all right, like, give it up, man. We understand. You're, this is a, a piece that's fucking talking directly about the war in Ukraine. Okay, we get it, but fuck off. I could go on about the lack of taste. For example, Berlin is home to the worst dressed people in the world. Everyone looks like they've been assaulted at a thrift store. But coincidentally, this thrift store only carried everything two sizes too big. In time, one learns that the bad outfits there do draw attention away from the even worse haircuts no one on the planet besides zendaya should be attempting micro bangs and you know what's really funny about the looks i think that's part of the beauty of it i think that's what makes club culture specifically on nightlife way more fun there because people actually go to have fun and don't go under the premise or under the assumption that they're going to show out they're going to stun they're going to shut it down it's all about me it's almost a weirdly collective feeling when you're going out like you're going out on your best behavior to make other person to make your time fun and to, then by default that makes other people who you don't know is time fun blah 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 it's a weird thing but most importantly i think doing away with the need to wear particular items apart from the psychos that go to Berghain and want to dress all black to try and get in most people go and essentially it's quite freeing because you don't feel like you are obliged to you know present a certain image you're not obliged you, you don't feel like you're going to be judged if you wear a certain item it's almost quite free especially for adults who need permission i don't ever i wear what the fuck i want but adults that need permission to do certain things feel very free feel very liberated when they go to berlin because it does allow you to kind of do what the fuck you want and no one bats an eyelid whether it's you wearing you know a skirt as a fucking jumper or if you're wearing tights as gloves whatever you want to do people won't even care so that's probably one thing why it makes it actually a fun city to be in and live in it continues but the worst part of berlin or germany in general has got to be the workplace no one, neither Americans nor Germans, will agree with me on this. But I staunchly believe that 30 vacation days per year is too many vacation days. Throw a rock at any Berlin workplace and you can bet 
it's rife with absentism and chaos. Okay, because I guess this person's American. How many vacation days do fucking Americans get? What the fuck are they talking about? How many? Let's see. I'm curious to see this. Vacation days in the USA. <gasps> you guys get 10 only. Typically, US employees will allocate 10 paid vacations per year to each employee, increasing the days provided based on the amount of time. So it's like how we are in the UK. Every year you stay with a company, it adds one more year to your vacation or something after a certain year 10 days no fucking way bro is this 10 days including let me check the chat guys is it 10 days including public holidays or is that excluding public holidays please don't tell me it's including please don't tell me it's including is it 10 days excluding public holidays because 10 days is fucking insane let me know what you guys say in the stream chat. I'm very curious to hear this. 10 days. <laughs> Bro, if we take off 10 days, we come back and get fired. <laughs> wow. It's more like free paid time off. And the rest of them is not paid off time. Wow, man. I've got, I've got to be, I've got to shut the fuck up then. I take it for granted. I think in the UK, we have like 26 if they get 30, we have, I think 30 is including the, the the public holidays. Yeah, so we get 28. We get 28, but that also includes public holidays. For the most part. Wow. That is insane, bro. Okay, yeah, we get 28, but I think I think 28 it does include public holidays. Yeah, it does include bank holidays. Bank holidays can be included in the minimum. Yeah, exactly. All work, exactly. All work. So in the UK, bank holidays are included in the 28, which makes complete sense. But wow, bro, you guys get only 10 days of vacation. 10 days of on top of public holidays. Okay, cool. They That's why they say Americans know nothing about countries. No time, no money to travel. Okay, you know what, Dan Sol? That makes a lot of sense now. The, the lack of curiosity Americans have about other countries isn't lack of intelligence. It's just because you don't have time to worry about that shit. You have to pay your bills. You have to fucking pay your taxes. You have to fucking pay your land dues, all that short nonsense you got in the States, your health insurance. You literally have to do so much to keep the lights on. You can't be worried about what's going on in fucking Sudan or what's happening in Greece or the fucking immigration situation in Sweden. Like that's not something you're fucking worried about because you literally have so much on your brain. 10 days of vacation is nutty though. Absolutely nutty. I couldn't believe that. But I also don't agree with this writer who says they think tw they think 30 days is too much do you guys do you would you guys agree that 30 vacation days per year is too many vacation days i guess if you're the owner of the business probably because if you own if you have a business and you have 100 employees and they all have 30 days of vacation it's going to be quite a, a arduous task torturous task to navigate and coordinate who goes on holiday when Obviously, in regular places, no two people from one team going on holidays at the same time. But you still have to sort. How do you have? You know what I mean? How do you make sure that half the office isn't away at a particular total time at the same time? It's a bit hard. But then you also can't deny people they actually want to go away and they've put in their requests early. So it's a fucked up thing. But I personally think that's why we have good work life balance, though. But that's probably why we don't earn enough money. We complain about the money we make in the UK compared to you guys in the states. But you guys also work way harder than we do around the clock especially without you know holiday and you know paid holiday we take way more time off um, we have way more liberties with sick leave and shit so it makes sense why you guys are where you are it continues this is what happens when people are constantly going away on hikes or visits to friends in switzerland and vienna trust me when i say that i have successfully worked at four separate berlin-based companies and i've never had to do more than two actual days of work per week wow now that i mention it I don't even think I'm totally positive about that at my current boss. Or what's that? I don't think I'm, uh, my current boss actually looks like. It's been a while. Sorry. Now that I mention it, I don't even think that I'm totally positive about what my current boss actually looks like. It's been a while. This sounds awesome in theory. If you're the type of person unconcerned with wanting to contribute meaningfully to society. 
but the end result is that everyone is in a little bit of a pissy passive aggressive um that's at all time sorry it's uh, really let's look at that again this sounds awesome in theory if you're the type of person who is unconcerned with wanting to contribute meaningfully to society but the end result is that everyone is a little bit pissy passive aggressive all the time now no one knows what everyone else does and nothing else gets done i have z learned zero new skills absorbed almost no good art but okay last weekend in vienna was pretty great I don't, I don't know if that's true i don't know if we are more pissy and passive aggressive in europe or in the uk compared to our u.s counterparts i don't think that's true i think all workplaces people get pissy and passive aggressive um probably you guys i've heard people say when they've worked with offices in the u.s you guys are too like ha 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 like golden retrievery everyone's laughing and too many pleasantries it's like a bit too much positivity positive like i remember someone's actually telling me like one thing they noticed about working with american people was that they love positivity like they don't like bad news like the manager doesn't want to hear it like tell me tell me the bad news to one side but don't announce it to the team you know what i mean we have to manage expectations it's like what like they're gonna find out anyway like why are we you know what i mean let's treat them like adults like nah tell me to the side you know what i mean don't ever spread bad news in public or it's, i don't know i find that to be a bit odd but one thing i've learned from this article is that american people earn their money you guys only have 10 days of paid vacation you guys really make your money you earn every money you make uh, out there it doesn't matter where you work the fact that you're only you're working all year round and only have 10 days you can take possibly but like Koyla mentioned in the chat it's not like you can take 10 days in a row if you do to take 10 days in a row you might not come back to a job you know so that you run that risk as well so you guys definitely earn your skrilla for sure you don't you know fuck me bro 10 days 10 days it's absolutely crazy. big up eduardo listening to az is the closest i've got to going overseas <laughs> oh what do you say um jack donny he says stop saying it's 10 dude 10 is a is not national figure so what is so what is a national figure then my friend if it's not 10 let me know if i got it wrong let me know what what is a national let's say um national figure of vacation days in u.s it's it said 10 but let's see how many vacations did you get in the usa 11 days of paid vacation per year in the private sector an average number of paid vacation days after five years increases to 15 after 10 years to 17 so the more you work somewhere the more vacation days you get well unfortunately we're in a come what we're in a come what we're in somewhat of a recession so it's probably it's fair to say a lot of people aren't going to be working in companies for 10 plus years going forward it's just not going to be common so you know the ability to go and have 11 days is not going to happen or 17 um there's no legally mandated vacation time in the uk <laughs> in the us oh my god you guys how is that possible how do you guys how do you guys work in this place what no legal mandate for vacation let's see let's see there's no legal oh my god no legal earlier mandate for vacation days in us all 50 states where vac vac vaccines no vacation also vaccines vacation vacation days let's see what that says in the US, there is no law requiring employers to provide. Wow. Paid leave is a perk. Oh my fucking God. All respect to my US listeners. My US watchers and US listeners, I respect you guys immensely. There is no legal requirement for an employer to provide any paid leave of any kind paid leave is a perk used to attract quality employees wow big up jack donaghy jr wow i'm blown away i'm honestly blown away by this there's no legal requirement <laughs> oh my god i would like we are so soft in the uk and europe we're so soft we are so fucking soft because i think i would break down in tears at, at my work at my desk in the toilet at the coffee machine 
if I found out that I, I didn't have any paid leave. I would break down in tears. Literally break down in tears. Wow. Oh my God. And the funny thing is in the UK, like that paid leave that I told you about, the 28 days, that applies across the board. Even if you work at fucking McDonald's, you can still get 28 days of fucking holiday or maybe 26, but definitely in the 20s. How does that make you, you know how nuts I must sound to an American person that you get 20 plus days of paid lead working full time at McDonald's? <laughs> it makes sense though, because you know, you're working at McDonald's, probably the one place you'd want to go on holiday is when you're working at McDonald's. But imagine if you're working in, in the US, there is no holidays. You turn up every day, you're on shift, you turn up, holidays don't exist. You make it work. You figure it out. We are so soft in the UK. We're really soft now. We're really fucking soft. I swear we're soft as fuck. Because I swear, if you went to McDonald's, let's see. Um, McDonald's UK. McDonald's UK paid leave vacation days. So you, watch. It's probably 26, same. Yeah, see? Hourly paid employees, see, in the UK. Hourly paid employees are entitled to 28 days per year, which is pro rata for part-time. So obviously, if you're part-time, you know, they break it up based on the hours you work. Holiday pay is accrued as employees work. So you can work in, at fucking McDonald's and get 28 days of holiday per year. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Honestly, man. Yeah, exactly. Pray for us, AZ. Especially those of us living in the South. Yeah, I pray for all of you guys. Honestly, my respect for you guys has gone up immensely. Now that I've learned this, even though I respected you guys anyway, but sometimes I'd throw these like unnecessary little barbs. Oh my God, the US people, you guys. Meh, meh, meh. Now I get it. Now it all makes sense how you guys are the way you are. No legal requirement for paid leave and you still turn up to work every day. Get it done. Pay the bills. Every day, every day, every day. Rain or shine, every day. Driving miles and miles and miles bus train fuck <laughs> yeah exactly that's why we're crazy and the only thing you have to look forward to is your fucking you know your weekends if that right if that because i imagine like most you know jobs it depends how your fucking rota is done is it sunday to sunday is it monday to sunday like you know sometimes your dev is on the wet like whatever you make it work wow that's also why you, when you guys let your hair down, you let your hair down, innit? This makes a lot more sense now. When you guys let your hair down and you want to party, you fucking go crazy because every other time you're working. Fuck. Fuck, 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 fuck. What an incredible article. But again, check out um, these links. I really like this page. Amazing. All these anonymous blogs they put up on there. I'm going to probably read another one about menswear at the, on the next podcast, which is this one here. And there's another one too that I want to check out about Brooklyn as well. Um, but there's all these quality, um, what you call it, articles on this site called These Links. It's a collection of, you know, hate-filled essays on Substack. So definitely check it out. An amazing article here. Taught me a lot about Berlin and also taught me a lot about fucking America and how difficult it is to fucking live there. And, you know, how hard and you... This may, that, that also makes a lot of sense why you guys survived so much abroad. When you guys do decide to work abroad, it makes a lot of sense why Americans are so good at it. Because, you know, look what you put up with day to day, living in where you where you guys live. So when you come to Europe, it's like a fucking, you know, it's like a walk in a park, literally and figuratively. When you come to the US, it's like a fucking walk in a park. Nothing is that hard for you anymore because you have to put up what you have to put up with. So big up everybody, um, you know, over there. I respect you guys fucking immensely. Fucking hell. What a fucking crazy place to be. But anyway, that has been the Action Zinger Show episode number seven six seven if it's your first time checking out the show thank you for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company if you're listening via the audio side of the podcast please make sure you like the stream down below if you're listening to this via the audio side of the podcast then all you have to do if you listen to the audio side of the podcast is press my fucking what you call it give me a little five star review and wherever you listen to podcasts, that'd be greatly, greatly appreciated. So please make sure you give me a five-star review wherever you guys listen to fucking podcasts. That'll be much, much, much appreciated. If you're watching this show live via YouTube, um, I will play for you my tune of the day. 
My tune today is by the one and only Maggie Rogers, courtesy of her new album. The track is called So Sick of Dreaming. So that's going to be my outro track for those of you who are, you know, listening to the fucking or watching or viewing this stream in real time via whatever means you're listening to. You will hear me play Maggie Rogers, So Sick of Dreaming. So you'll hear that play in the background here as I kind of sign out. For those rest of you who are around, thank you for chilling. It's been a fucking fun time. And I'll see most of you guys again very, very shortly for another episode of the fucking random show, which is going to be coming at you in about 20 minutes. So if you want to check that out, then obviously keep an eye on my channel and I'll put another link up there in a minute for the random show happening very, very, very soon. But obviously we're going to sign out with a bit of fucking Maggie Rogers for the sake of it. Why the fuck not? And then I'll see you guys on the other side very, very soon. But thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. Never a chore. I'll see most of you guys again very shortly. But for those of you I don't, take care, be safe and be well.